Good evening. Uh, we're very excited to have you join us for this evening program, Behind the Scenes, the New Bedford Whaling Museum Collection and its challenges. Um, can folks hear me? I can yes, hear you. Okay. okay. <laughs> That's always that moment when you go live. <laughs> um, so uh, this is going to be kind of a, an informal conversational approach to talking about the museum's collections. This is um, organized in concert with the exhibition that we currently have up in the Waddles Gallery called Unvarnished, focusing on uh, a panorama painted by Charles Sidney Raleigh. And we'll look at some of that a little later in the program tonight. Um, but really, it seemed like a good opportunity to just talk about the collection and, and what we have and go behind the scenes. So I'm really uh, pleased that that the three of us here could come together. And I'm looking forward to talking um, with Jordan Burson and Stephen Lubar uh, about the museum and its collections, and then opening it up to questions from all of you in attendance. So um, we'll start just by doing some brief introductions here. So I'm Naomi Slip, Chief Curator at the New Bedford Whaling Museum, and I'll hand it off to uh, Steve, you're right below me. Good evening, everybody. I'm Steve Lubar. I'm a professor of American Studies at Brown University. Good evening. I'm Jordan Burson, Director of Collections at the Whaling Museum and have been for eight years. Great. So if I figure out how to move us forward here in the presentation. Oh. Okay. So uh, we thought we'd start with the very beginning here, what is in our collection? Um, so the New Bedford Whaling Museum, as I assume most people in attendance know, since you found us in the program, is a pretty eclectic collection and it is wide and deep. So the basics by the numbers, we have uh, 200,000 items approximately in the photography collection, 750,000 objects in the library and archives collection, and about 38,000 items in the permanent collection. And that would cover all sorts of objects and materials, including uh, traditional paintings and sculpture. And as you'll see, lots of other exciting materials. This totals almost a million total objects in the museum collection. That's a lot to keep track of and take care of. Um, so Steve, Jordan, do you uh, wanna jump in and share anything about kind of the breadth of the collection or thinking about this kind of massive amount of objects before we... Sure, well, as many of you may know, uh, we are under the umbrella of the Old Dartmouth Historical Society. So the breadth of collections is vast. It's not just harpoons. It's not just paintings. Uh, there's every kind of material that you can imagine in the collection from audiovisual materials to textiles and um, glassware. And the list just goes on and on. And each of these kinds of collections require different care and uh, different ways of handling them. I'll just jump in and say that when I was first introduced to the collections of the, of the museum, I was astonished at the, the breadth. Um, it's a history museum, it's an art museum, it's a natural history museum. Um, and in each of those fields, there's really enormous depths and then a local history museum. So um, it has in some ways, all of the wonderful challenges of all of those kinds of museums uh, each of those kinds of objects needs different kinds of collections care that we'll talk about, but the decisions you make about how to collect in each of those fields is very different, which gives the, the territorial staff of the museum um, no end of interesting and exciting challenges all the time. That's great. And I think that's one of the things we're going to think about a little bit further as we move deeper into this discussion, right, is that um, most museums are pretty specialized and, and have sort of a, a closer focus in terms of collections. So you think about a science museum is going to be really adept at dealing with, say, wet specimens. Um, and an art museum is going to be really focused on paintings and sculpture, et cetera, et cetera. And, and here we are, we have, we have um, collections that run the gamut. Um, so what are those? Uh, well, we thought we'd pull out some interesting things. 
from the collection, including, I'm just trying to figure out if maybe there's, I think it's just moving very slowly. I apologize, folks, I'll be patient. Um, okay, so here we are, <laughs> including the very large. Jordan, do you wanna walk us through some of the things we have on the screen here? Sure, so um, the picture at the top left is uh, a, marine, a piece of marine salvage that is actually the windlass, which is like a giant winch from the forecastle of the Bark Wanderer, one of the last whale ships to leave New Bedford. And it didn't make it very far before wrecking on Cuddyhunk, the island of Cuddyhunk in the Elizabeth Islands. And that, that was 1923, I believe. And in the 80s, it was salvaged by the Kendall family. And it was brought up and brought back to land, and it still had Cuddyhunk rocks embedded in it and uh, some of its chain was still intact and it's just a monster it's very heavy um, I've seen it moved about four times in the past eight years and each time that requires bringing in a crane heavy equipment uh, to the right of that you'll see an Azorian milk cart and um, while it's certainly not the biggest thing in our collection um, it's very fragile because the wheels are just tenuously holding themselves together. You can see that the stand it's on gives it support from underneath um, just to take a little bit of the pressure off of the spokes. Uh, I will jump in and say, I love that Jordan said it's not the biggest in our collection, but I did write down the dimensions of these and it is 85 inches long and has 30 inch diameter wheels. So. <laughs> it's big, but compare it uh, with the Lagoda on the right, right <laughs> the largest ship in the world it's a half scale whaler um it's actually not an object you can move around it's built into the floor thank goodness we can't move it because we probably would have by now uh, <laughs> it's just a really wonderful object it's uh, got full functional rigging and it's really a wonder uh and i guess that's the lagoda's anchor what am i oh, what is the one in the middle Yes, yeah, it's uh, an anchor. I was just thinking about heavy stuff. <laughs> yes, we um, do have a couple of anchors in the collection. And also, uh, the bigger of the two does require moving with a crane. If you're curious to see it, we had the crane gently deposit it on the lawn of the Mariner's home across the street, where many wedding parties enjoy using it as a backdrop. Uh, to the far left on the bottom is a full sperm whale skeleton, which is mounted on a custom stand. So it's articulated, but it also has support from above. It's a little hard to see, but there are cables running from the spine through the ceiling and up into the rafters uh, for uh, to bear its weight. And again, that's another thing I'm pleased that we haven't needed to move in my time. It doesn't look like a fun project. Mm -hmm. Well, and I didn't include, we'll have a picture of Kobo being moved later, but I didn't include him. I'm guessing he's probably our longest object at 66 feet, right? Our blue whale specimen. Yes, and in fact, uh, if you've seen it in the Jacobs Family Gallery, it's not actually, uh, elongated the way it probably would be in nature because right. He's the, curve. In the building so they kind of curved it down in the most extreme yet still natural position the whale skeleton could be in um so it's just massive and it's not, not even really one of the biggest blue whales so we also have uh the largest <laughs> jordan will you talk a little bit about what we see in front of us here so many of you are probably familiar with this work. This is Purrington and Russell's 1848 grand panorama of a whaling voyage around the world, uh, stretching 1,375 feet long. We needed to find a 70,000 square foot mill space in order to display it in its entirety. Um, it was such a feat just finding the space um, that in fact it hadn't been seen in this fashion since 1961. So um, it was really a special event. And for people wondering, that's about four football fields, right? I think that's what I've heard. 
I'll take your word for it. <laughs> so from the very largest then, we go to the very, very small. Um, and these are some things that I had pulled from the collection and thinking about um, very, very small things. Uh, because the museum has collected all sorts of areas, we have actually quite a large collection of children's toys and amongst those miniatures. And so on the left side, you see two examples from the miniature collection, including this little rug, which is two inches by four inches and very thin, this tiny painted um, tea set designed with little tiny bamboo handles in a kind of Japanese style. Um, nuts collected on a whaling voyage at the top there. Beneath that, those are the furry cocoons of silkworms. In the center, two daguerreotypes from our extensive photography collection. Daguerreotypes, little, small, two inch by three inch, unique photographs of individuals. Um, the second column from the right shows uh, Anupiak works from the Arctic, a uh, tiny carved polar bear with a little fish in its mouth that's about two inches long, and an eight inch wide pin cushion lined with polar bear fur on the outside. And then on the far right, stamps, a whale stamp from a log book, which is about two inches long and would have been used to record the whales caught on a voyage. And then stamps, uh, a full uncut sheet here of postage stamps um, that record actually the visage of the Wanderer, the ship that Jordan was talking about that went down in Cuddyhunk. You know, so it's, it's, it's so interesting you chose <laughs> because they're very small, but in fact, you sort of covered the range of the kinds of things the museum has. So at very yeah. small scale, you can see you know, everything from, um, objects from Cuddyhunk and objects from the Arctic and uh, natural history and, and doll toys. It's mm -hmm. really quite a wonderful choice. And everything in between. And you have to imagine like who was that person that you know brought those cocoons from the silkworm back here and, and what were the conversations that they inspired, right? I mean, each of these objects found their way to New Bedford and, and um, made their way into our collection because somebody thought they were special. Uh, and it does inspire interesting things um, to think about. So along with the very large and the very small, uh, we are, uh, we do follow federal mandates in terms of our collections. There are ethical considerations that we have to follow that impact uh, how we collect and how we treat our collections. So these are two examples, probably the, the biggest ones that impact us as a, as a museum in the United States. NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, Steve, do you wanna talk a little bit about NAGPRA and just kind of generally what it means for museums? Sure. Um, there are, according to the American Alliance of Museums, 37 laws that museums, that affect museum collections in one way or another. Um, you've mentioned the top two, but the other one that might be included is uh, just the rules about importing artifacts and art from around the world, um, what the rules are for bringing objects across borders. NAGPRA, the Native Americans Grave uh, Protection and Repatriation Act, is designed to repatriate to the, the proper native nation or tribe um, objects that don't belong in museums. And there's a long list of possible of types. Uh, it includes uh, religious objects, objects of, of, um, that can't be alienated by an individual. Um, things, of course, the, the major category that people think about is skeletons. Um, and but connected associated grave goods as well. So there's a, a list that requires uh, negotiation and discussion to decide where is an appropriate place that it should be repatriated to. And every museum uh, over the last almost 30 years now has dealt with this and has figured out ways in fact that uh, allow these objects to, to be where they belong and oftentimes to learn more about them as well. Um, when NAGPRA was first passed, it was a um, controversial 
law. Many museums were concerned about it. Um, almost every museum has come to understand it as a very useful part of their work now. So that other uh, act that that we um, that affects our our operations a fair amount, I would say, um, because of our focus on whaling and um, whale biology and whale conservation, is the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Jordan, can you uh, briefly speak to that a little bit and just what that means for our collections and what it means when we get an inquiry about uh, ivory or um, uh, tusk or whale whale bone? Yeah, so uh, the law is very state by state. I mean, there are federal laws, but it, it's a little bit confusing. Um, I often actually refer to uh, an antiques dealer uh, and auctioneer that I know who tends to stay up on the latest regulations, but um, certainly importing anything is uh, something we avoid at all costs. Um, I've heard stories about people bringing legitimate scrimshaw into the country and having th these historic materials uh, destroyed by the government. So mm -hmm. um, well-intentioned, but you know, um, there are mistakes that are made often. So it's not worth the risk really. Mm -hmm. um, interstate is another matter. Uh, we tend to allow ivory objects to be shipped to us for examination, but um, not for sale or, or anything like that. Um, selling and um, scholarly analysis are two different things. So it really behooves anybody who is a collector or uh, wishes to deal in this material to check the latest of the day regulations. Right. And really what what the Marine Mammal Protection Act is attempting to, to halt or stop is the continued um, trade in contemporary marine mammal parts, right? And so it's this question of like, if something uh, is deemed historically authentic that predates the act and, and is, is kind of cleared in title, uh, then it, it doesn't fall under the um, restrictions of the act, right? But it's really complicated to, to prove that. And so sometimes it's worth more uh, trouble than, than maybe good. Another reason it's complicated is because it was legal to buy and sell ivory up until 1972. But a lot right. of people say that um, anything that's not 100 years old is not a real antique. So mm -hmm. um, anything between 1923, therefore, and 1971 is suspicious. Right. So these are two of the kind of ethical considerations that we, we deal with in, in addressing our collections and making sure that we're following federal regulations and, and mandates. Um, but another fun part of our collection, I think, in thinking about what we were gonna talk about today uh, was to consider uh, the dangerous parts of our collection. Uh, so that includes things that might have live gunpowder or unexploded ordnance or sharp and pointy objects. I mean, we have, how many harpoons do you think we have, Jordan, in the collection? Several hundred. <laughs> So dangerous things. Um, we also have materials that are potentially poisonous and that includes things that may be treated with arsenic or mercury. Um, that includes, uh, not necessarily with our collection, I don't think, but it's possible radioactive materials. Um, and then certainly things that are flammable and combustible. So these are just a few examples of, of things, again, that I had pulled from the collection to kind of give us a sense of, of the scope of what we might consider dangerous objects. In the lower right, we have a mercurial barometer, which includes mercury. We have in the upper middle, uh, a swivel gun, a harpoon gun with a steel barrel. It's the largest known whaling gun. This is uh, 49 pounds as well. So it's quite heavy. <laughs> um, we have things like uh, the brake fluid in the lower left and the whale oil, um, which of course is very flammable. <laughs> we have the shark's tooth hand weapon in the upper right from the Gilbert Islands, which is edged with shark's teeth to create a blade. 
We have things like the woven quiver in the bottom middle, uh, which is said to be from the Javero Indians of South America, Peru and Ecuador, um, maybe Arawak and potentially includes poisoned uh, darts in it. We have the bundle of tail feathers in the top, which include the plume of a tropic bird from the Marquesas Islands, um, and which potentially, like many ethnographic collections, could have been treated at some point with arsenic or merc uh, mercury uh, to keep insects at bay. Similarly, we have the seal skin boots in the bottom uh, middle there, uh, that may also likely have been treated at some point in their life uh, with some kind of um, uh, chemical to keep bugs away from them. Those are Arctic, probably from the Bering Strait. Uh, and they're these beautiful bearded seal soles. They've been covered with ash. Um, the upper is ringed seal skin dyed with alder bark. Um, and they're possibly from uh, King Island or St. Lawrence. Um, and then in the lower right, we have a, what looks like a stuffed goldfinch underneath a dome. Um, much taxidermy actually includes uh, poisonous uh, chemicals. And in fact, quite a number of 19th century taxidermists were known to um, experience uh, very ill health and side effects from working with the kind of chemicals that they did to create the taxidermy specimens that they worked with. So I think those are everybody, oh, I forgot um, the, the piece in the far left, which is a, a harpoon cannon, which not only is it very heavy, but potentially dangerous. So um, Steve, Jordan, do you wanna elaborate on the dangers of the collection um, on any of these objects, on uh, dealing with unexploded ordnance or uh, sharp and pointy things or flammable combustible objects? We did have some gunpowder that we discovered, uh, black powder, a uh, few mm -hmm. years back, and uh, after a little investigating, it was determined the best thing to do was to flush it down the toilet. I don't remember if we flushed it down the toilet or poured it into a storm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. water. It's, it's, it's a common thing for museums to find um, unexploded ordnance and, and that kind of thing. And what you're supposed to do, I've never heard flush it down the toilet before, but call the, call the police department um, bomb squad and tell them what you've got. I used to have oversight of the military, the arms collection at the Museum of American History at the Smithsonian and um, enormous room full of basically um, things full of gunpowder. And um, lots of thought about whether you should have live ammunition in a museum. I think the answer is it's basically a bad idea or if you're going to put it in a place where it's safe. Um, scientific instruments are really interesting objects to think about, uh, lots of mercury, but also for more recent ones, many of them have radioactive components. Um, it was some, one of the things that was done every so often was you would sweep through the collections area with a Geiger counter to see if anything was radioactive and needed to be moved. And then the decision, of course, is do you have to destroy it? Is it just needs to be kept in a particularly safe area? Or do you just need clear guidelines about, about handling? Uh, so all of these things, objects are wonderful and they're what makes museums special, but you need to be careful of them too sometimes. Absolutely. What radioactive materials did you find, Steve? Well, one of the big, we had lots of uh, scientific apparatus. And so one of the things that you would have as, as part of that are um, either objects that had been exposed to radiation and had become slightly radioactive, or in collections of, of minerals, you have you know, collections of uranium. And it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, you did mention here asbestos. Um, lots oh, of yeah. museums have many uh, examples. If, if you have an old steam engine, it was covered with asbestos at one point, and uh, hopefully somebody has taken that out. But uh, if not, you either need to be very careful about it or cover it in a way that it's not going to come out. So uh, thinking about objects that, you know, either because of what they were, um, they had intrinsic danger or um, 
objects that, you know, brake fluid is not dangerous if you use it in the right place, but if you have to worry about um, a fire in a museum, it's important. I'll just mention one last piece. Um, you mentioned the wet storage of, of natural history collections. Basically, many natural history collections are kept in alcohol, and alcohol is very flammable. Um, at one point, I was slightly involved with trying to figure out what building code applied to a room full of jars full of alcohol. And it turns out it's like a liquor store in many ways, and there are real strict rules about um, fire code. So getting those things away from the museum into safe storage um, with a place where if it explodes, it's not gonna hurt anybody, seems like a good idea. Mm -hmm. And we do, we have uh, extensive examples of brake fluid and products made from whale oil, which are in a fire safe. And actually, Jordan, do you wanna share what we're, we'll be doing in like a week's time? We, we received this query from a, a media outlet Yes, somebody asked us a question we didn't know the answer to, and that is if spermaceti is flammable, if it will burn. So we're going to be doing a test out in the back plaza, Cuffey Park, uh, where we're going to attempt to ignite some spermaceti on fire. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. Um, that is making me think though, one of the things I didn't include in here, just because I couldn't find a good image from our collection of it, but it's more than likely that we also have things that um, are made with arsenic green. Um, textiles and books, uh, a lot of them included this really bright, vibrant, like verdigris green color, um, which it was made or created in part with arsenic. Um, so lots of libraries and book collections especially have a fair amount of arsenic objects. And wallpaper um, too. Yes, yeah. So that does lead us to think about how do we store, move, and install collections? Um, these are some behind the scenes shots of some of our storage areas at the museum. Um, uh, what are ideal storage collection conditions? Um, you can see some examples here. Jordan, Steve, do you wanna talk a little bit about what it means to kind of safely store collections? What, what we have to think about? Sure. Well, uh, there's a number of things you should keep in mind. Uh, aside from a safe dry room, uh, temperature, relative humidity, light, uh, accessibility. Uh, that's one that a lot of people don't think of, but if you're making awkward motions to get things off of shelves or out of drawers, you can risk damage to the objects. The shelves and the racks themselves are generally either powder coated or enameled. Uh, and the reason for that is because wooden shelves and other kinds of materials can off gas and stain or otherwise deteriorate the objects. Um, pests, you wanna make sure that the environment is pest free. And uh, just generally, when you're handling these things, you know, using common sense, we have specialized racks for moving paintings around. If you look at that middle image, you'll see a lot of the frames have very delicate gesso ornamentation. Uh, it's extremely fragile. So you have to, you know, be careful not to knock those corners or other parts of the frame into anything when you're moving them. So we have these padded A-frame painting moving devices. Uh, I didn't change that slide. Oh, okay. Oops, sorry. Um, no, no, no. I'm just, sorry. that was, sorry. Has a mind of it. There we go. It has a mind of its own. So, you know, using um, a cart when you're moving things around like the ceramics at left, uh, believe it or not, uh, the handles that were designed to pick up a lot of those pieces are not used for picking them up today. You don't pick up an, a glass or an urn or anything with a handle by its handle because it actually is the weakest part of the object. You pick it up um, with two hands around the widest part. Um, we could go to another slide. There's some interesting images you picked out. This is, these are not the New Bedford Whaling Museum, but uh, they show some of the challenges with moving large objects. It takes a lot of people. It takes um, specialized tools like pallet jacks and, um, and hand trucks and that sort of thing. 
And I saw that next slide that you flashed shows our Concordia YOL model, which is gigantic, as you can see. We had to move it into our new building, and it required a crane to do it. And that's, um, you know, not something that happens every day, but it's not atypical of uh, moving large museum objects around. I'll just add one piece to that, Jordan. You mentioned the equipment and the, the taking care of things. It's also the skilled people who know how to move things. Well, that's really important that um, you have that expertise in the right way to move objects and that you do it slowly and without rushing and carefully and um, having a, you know, always have a place to put something down before you pick it up kind of rules. So there's lots of just object handling skills that museum people need to learn, um, some of which may be common sense and some of it is um, really learn taught from you know museum person to museum person so uh, the right equipment is important but the right skills are, are just as important exactly and here we have an image of uh, moving two whale boats from one storage unit to another and again it involves a, a flatbed truck and a crew of movers uh, interesting you'll notice that this truck has the bed above the wheels there's another kind of a flatbed that has a sway back type setup, which is useful when you're moving something tall because you have to consider telephone lines in the streets. <laughs> this is the same firm. They were hired to move very large blue whale parts. This is part of our Kobo blue whale skeleton being brought to shore. Actually, I take that back. Uh, this is after the recovery of the whale in Rhode Island. They uh, processed it and put the various very large bones into the harbor to allow sea life to eat away at the uh, meat. And that's what's going on here. So this was in preparation for getting it into the museum. And for... This is 1998, by the way. One of, one of my favorite parts of museum work was working with riggers who are people who professionally move very large objects. And we, in my former museum, we move things like locomotive engines and uh, train cars. And um, there are people who think nothing of moving, you know, 30 or 40 tons in a very small tight space and uh, not scratching it at all. Um, so it's just wonderful to watch these, these skilled uh, move riggers move heavy objects. Um, they're they're good, and they also now do art large, you know, sculpture. Uh, that's a whole specialized world of, of of art handling, and art that weighs a lot and is very large is a whole specialized world. And when you watch it executed perfectly, it's like an a symphony. Yeah. You know, everyone has their part to play, and they move in this kind of orchestrated manner, and it it just is like so natural and smooth it's it it seems effortless <laughs> this is not so effortless uh this is a little video um of us moving the milk cart recently from the born building and i'll just play a little bit of it um, and see how this works to play That's not a very cooperative can. <laughs> this, by the way, is a different milk cart. For those of you wondering, uh, this has much more robust wheels, so it might be handled a little differently. I'll move it forward a little bit.
And there we go, down the sidewalk. <laughs> but that'd be fun to share a little something, a little snippet of, of us moving something recently in the museum that is quite large and it is very heavy. All of the components are um, blacksmith worked iron. So um, it's an uh, extraordinarily heavy piece. Um, so if I go forward now, okay. Um, so I think one of the big questions that hopefully is emerging for people is uh, how do we keep our collections safe? Um, what does it mean to do that and what things should we be worried about? And both Jordan and uh, Steve have already mentioned a little bit some of the things that we have to think about um, with collections care. So those include things like security and theft, water damage, humidity levels, temperature controls, uh, damage from visitors. Um, bugs, fire, catastrophe, acid and dirt on objects from touching, uh, light damage, dangerous objects, acts of violence, and safe handling, transport, and storage. Um, I will reinforce the note at the bottom of this slide that none of these images are from the museum. <laughs> um, purely examples to give you a sense of the kinds of things that we have to protect the collections from. Jordan, Steve, do you want to jump in on anything or should we keep moving along here? I feel like we've well, kind of... I'd like to mention the image on the bottom left is a device called a recording hygrothermograph. And uh, there's a psychrometer below that. Uh, Steve, are people still using that style or uh, we have PEM2? Yeah, so and almost everybody, there's these wonderful digital tools that automatically report onto a a uh, single page on your computer screen that shows all of the temperatures and humidity. Uh, I'll just say one thing about the um, climate control. It's very expensive for museums to keep really good climate control. And it's something that museums worry about all the time. It's very easy for things to go wrong in climate control in museums. And um, the most important, as a general rule, um, if objects are kept, at a stable temperature and humidity, they're they're pretty good. I mean, they should be. Um, there's there's temperatures that are best for them, humidities that are best. But uh, many objects lasted for a long time before there was air conditioning. And uh, what is when you have disasters on the climate control side is when things change quickly. When your air conditioning system fails on a humid summer day you can have, um, well, everything can be covered with mold very quickly in a museum. Uh, things can crack if things are suddenly, it's the heat and temperature and humidity control goes out and everything becomes dry. And so uh, it's not just setting it at the right temperature, it's thinking about what can go wrong all the time is something that keeps um, museum collections managers up at night. <laughs> So there are target standards for uh, general museum collections. Uh, you know, as mentioned before, every kind of an object has different kinds of needs, but a good general range is somewhere between 45 and 55% relative humidity and uh, somewhere between 68. And you have to balance human comfort too, unless you're talking about a storage room, which can be kept at a colder temperature. But in the galleries, uh, 68 is really good because it may be a little cool for some visitors, but you know, um, the cooler the air, the less uh, of the chemical degradation will be going on. So um, yeah, we have PEM2 data loggers in the galleries they uh as steve was saying they record both relative humidity as well as uh temperature and then you can put a little uh thumb drive into it and take the data to your computer and it will generate reports to tell you to show you um spikes uh at certain times of the day or night it, it can help you adjust the system and it also lets you know if you have uh risk of damage to certain kinds of collections as well. So it's a very nice kind of a system. What you see on the left that recording hygrothermograph is a very traditional kind of recording device. It's, uh, you know, it takes a lot of user intervention. You have to take the paper out 
and um, interpret the graphs. So thinking about old school and new school, <laughs> um, how do we know what we have? On the bottom left, you'll see a number on what looks like a swordfish bill sword. It says 1908.5.1.3. So that's uh, a unique identifying number that no other object in the museum would have. And it's easy to decode as follows. 1908 is the year that that sword was acquired. Five means it was the fifth acquisition of 1908. One means it was the first object within that fifth acquisition of 1908. And three means it's the third component of that uh, first object of the fifth donation <laughs> of 1908. I hope I didn't mess that up. No, that was perfect. Um, uh, Steve? Every object, every object should have its number either written on it in beautiful small handwriting that I'm always jealous of people who can do that or on fabric items, textiles that's often sewed into it. There's a whole lot of rules about the best way to mark your objects. And it's a real, it's a real specialty of people, uh, of registrars who keep track of things. And the other half of the system is there's that unique number in each object. And that number is directly connected in your database. And that's the, the picture at the top there of to the records about that object. And uh, ideally also in many museums, an accession file that, that um, Jordan mentioned that this is the, the this session of that year. Um, the, the paperwork, the, the purchase, the, the receipt or the deed of gift or whatever it is, is tied to that object too. So the objects are the key to understanding what's in the collection and every object needs, I tell my students, every object needs a number, every number needs an object, it's gotta, um, and you've gotta be able to connect the paperwork to the database, to the thing. That, that's sort of the key of, of being a good registrar, I think. And there's the key the right there. The location is registered into the record. So every unique identifying number has a location mm -hmm. uh, because we have so many shelves and so many storage units, you'd never find it by just eyeballing. And remember, we have almost a million things from the very, very largest to the very, very teeny tiniest. So as long as those unique objects are marked with their number and the location is recorded, we know what we have and we know where to find it. And those are the most important things. So um, we're, we're winding up on the quarter of the hour here. Uh, and I, I do want to just talk briefly about um, the, the kind of inspiration for sitting down and having this conversation. And it's the current special exhibition that we have up in Waddle's gallery um, called Unvarnished, Conservation of Charles Sidney Raleigh's Panorama of a Whaling Voyage. Um, I hope that attendees in the audience have been able to come and see the exhibition at the museum. I, I hope uh, if you haven't yet, uh, you will. The show is up through March 6th, which is a Sunday. Um, these are some views of the exhibition of the gallery space. This is an exhibition that features a panorama painting painted by Charles Sidney Raleigh, who was a New Bedford area artist um, who created this painting as a public entertainment in 1878. It was exhibited around the South Coast until about 1905 and then was donated to the New Bedford Whaling Museum in 1918. As a panorama painting, it was on one very large uh, roll of canvas. Uh, to give you a sense, the, the series had 22 individual scenes. Each of them are six feet high by 12 feet wide. Uh, so it would have been hundreds of feet long. Um, and it shows the, the story of the Niger, a New Bedford whaling vessel that traveled for four years in the South Pacific around New Zealand uh, whaling before coming home to port. Um, but the show focus is not just on the story of the Niger and Charles Sidney Raleigh himself and the exhibition of the panorama painting, but it also is thinking a little bit about um, the challenges of our collection. So in 1958, uh, the painting, if I scoot ahead a little bit, I think I have the slide in here. Um, the museum made the decision to cut the painting up into 2020, 22, excuse me, individual pieces and send it out for conservation. 
Uh, and what was decided at the time was that uh, these individual panels would be uh, mounted on huge aluminum sheets uh, that it turns out made the paintings about 300 pounds a piece. So we have 18 of these paintings. They're over 300 pounds. They're six inches high by 12 or six feet, excuse me, six inches, that would be different. They're six feet high by 12 feet wide. They're very challenging to move, to store, to hang. Here you see in the, the right, the conveyance that we store them in right now uh, with all 18 uh, or 17 in here. Um, it becomes many, many tons. So they're really challenging to, to move uh, and handle and, and deal with. And so the exhibition is trying to think a little bit about what it means to work with objects like these, what it means to be responsible for our collections. Um, the conservation work was completed across the 1960s. Um, and because of the weight of the paintings, um, they have suffered a little bit because they're hard to store, they're hard to manage, they're hard to take care of. Um, so we thought we would have a conversation about what conservation is, what it means to think about caring for collections, what our responsibilities are to collections, um, what we might do with these paintings, um, uh, what kind of work it might take to take care of them. This is uh, one of the galleries and you can see um, in the right side here, I'm not sure that you can see, can you see my cursor? No, there's a little blue swatch of sky on the right side of the painting. You can see that little square. Um, that's one area where varnish has been removed from the surface of the picture. And so you get a sense of just what a cleaning would do to the painting to brighten up the surfaces. Um, but the big question is really about the panel that they're mounted on and what kind of effect that's having on the work and also how the weight of the work itself presents these really unusual challenges for us in dealing with the paintings. So as I said, you know, the exhibition is hopefully an opportunity for us to talk about conservation and the responsibilities of the museum. Here you see them leaning against the wall and I think you get a better sense of their scale. So Steve, Jordan, do you have anything you wanna add here in thinking about this exhibit and framing some questions as we kind of head into the moment where we'll hear from the audience? It, it just raises all the wonderful questions. You know, museums store things, they take care of them and they do that because they're useful. They, they're educationally valuable or they're scientifically valuable. And what's always the interesting challenge is that you never have enough space or time or money to treat everything perfectly or to collect everything you might possibly want to collect. You're always making decisions. And what makes museum work so fascinating is that those decisions are complicated. What do you, if you save one thing, you may not be able to save something else. If you spend your conservation money on one thing, you can't save, you can't spend it on something else. Uh, how do you think about uh, what's worth saving and why? Um, and not only what's worth saving, but to what extent does it compare to other objects and to the funds you've got available? And so this is a great example of an important object, but a very expensive one in terms of space and conservation time. Uh, how do you compare this with you know, filling up the those little tiny objects, you can store a lot of things, a uh, lot, little, lot of little things, uh, which mm -hmm. have their own conservation problems. So just raises lots of good questions. Jordan, can you elaborate too on the difference between like stabilization and preservation and conservation and restoration? Those are like actually four different things. Sorry. <laughs> sure. um, I just want to add to what you just said, Steve, mm -hmm. first. Um, when you're Conserving something small, generally, it's an easy to bite, take a bite at, you know, a project that's a bite-sized project. Something like this, uh, you start, the way we propose this project is to start with one panel and then use the first treatment as a model for the successive panels. Um, in a way, the fact that it's chopped into 
17 pieces makes it a little bit easier. Uh, when we conserved the Purrington and Russell panorama, it was a massive project that had to be done all at once. So there on four a, football fields. Yeah. And um, there is a difference between conservation and restoration. And um, the thing is not, er conservation isn't always right for all projects and nor is restoration. Uh, conservation is a philosophy wherein you stabilize and prolong the life of an object um, with minimal intervention. And restoration is when you do a full aesthetic makeover um, physical as well as aesthetic. Um, that's not to say you can't do some restorative maneuvers within a conservation treatment. For instance, let's say you wanted to stabilize a painting, but there's a big detracting visual, visually detracting blotch in the middle. It would be okay to tone down that detracting visual while not restoring the entire painting and still call it a conservation treatment. Generally, if you can see where the treatment has been done, uh, where you see, uh, can detect what is new material versus old, uh, that qualifies as conservation. Restoration, um, you could be more heavy handed. You can remove or eradicate original material and replicate it. So that's the difference. And we have some questions here that came right. in through chat. What does the museum see as its collecting priorities for 20th and 21st century stories related to whaling, New Bedford and its environs? Um, well, one thing that I know right off the bat is ecology and conservation of whales is certainly um, something that will likely continue focusing, uh, will continue focusing on. It's a good question. And every museum needs to have plans for what they're going to collect, what they're, uh, every museum has a mission statement and uh, your collections have to match up with your mission statement somehow. You collect the things that uh, your board of directors has decided that's the mission of the museum. Uh, it's so interesting at the Willing Museum because it really is a multi-part mission statement of old Dartmouth history and history of whaling and um, contemporary whale ecology and science. And so there's a balancing act that goes on there. Uh, the museum has two documents that help to, to shape this. Um, the collections development plan is the uh, list of what, in, in large categories, what the museum has. Uh, what it needs more of to fill its, fulfill its mission, and what it needs less of because it's no longer as important to the mission. That's the deaccessioning question. And then the other one, equally important, is the collections management policy that lists things like loan policy or uh, who gets to this, what's the proper procedure by which objects are brought into the museum, who gets, who has authority to do that. Um, uh, conservation policy, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the Jordan's point about the, you know, a big change in, in the last decade or two is the much larger emphasis on marine science, uh, whale ecology. Um, you know, Naomi, you're probably the best person to talk about some of the things you're thinking about for um, accessioning new, new directions mm -hmm. to go, uh, things to be accessioned. Yeah, so I think in, in the collecting area, the, um, the priority is really to think about uh, areas where we can expand uh, the kinds of stories that we can tell. So collecting works by um, regional female artists, um, collecting works that speak to um, uh, the kind of histories of different immigrant communities within the region and especially kind of 20th century community archives, business records and, and things that really relate to and tell the story of the growth of, of neighborhoods and, and um, uh, different kind of um, uh, um, regional uh, institutions that are important to the community and its expansion. Um, 
I would say in terms of uh, deaccessioning, we, we do deaccession objects following our collections management policy. Um, recently, we've been assessing um, some objects from a large gift that came in that could be deaccessioned. So the restrictions on gifts vary. Um, and that includes a, a fair amount of kind of redundant or repetitive furnishings kind of generic 19th century furniture, which takes up a lot of space. We have very little uh, area in the museum where we exhibit furniture. We certainly don't um, include period rooms, say, except for the small uh, kitchen area, uh, which is much beloved and we're not changing that. Um, uh, we have accessioned a few very, very large um, 19th century carpets recently. Um, things that that really it's about space. It's about um, what are the likelihoods that we exhibit it. Uh, is it a perfect example? Is it a, a rare example? Is it unusual? Is it uh, regionally important? Is it tied to uh, a regional figure of importance? What's the provenance? Um, those are the kinds of questions that we ask before we consider deaccession. Um, but but we certainly are um, as we grow the collection. We're also thinking about areas um, to to deaccession to make you know, to, to think about space and, and about um, what what we're working towards. Um, Basically the same questions that we ask ourselves when we uh, are facing a potential acquisition. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's worth noting, you know, the museum, we do not accept everything that's offered to us. Um, accepting something into the collection is just Im as important of a consideration as a conversation as uh, deaccessioning things. And that is also about scope and about um, priority areas for collecting, about redundancy, about space, about condition, uh, about, uh, you know, the importance of an example and provenance, um, all of these questions that we have to consider. Another question here is the collection fully cataloged? Um, museum collections are never really fully cataloged. Uh, there's always more work to be done. Uh, Jordan, do you want to just say briefly what you couldn't put in here in, in the chat? I think you hit the nail on the head. You hit the nail on the head, Steve. Um, often something will be cataloged, but there are different um, depths to which you can go when you catalog incoming collections. Uh, for instance, we have this dollhouse that came into the collection recently oh, with yeah. a couple of thousand related objects, very small pieces of uh, china on the tables, uh, furniture, artwork, just about every accessory you could imagine. And so we have a umbrella record for the dollhouse and its contents, but in order to item level catalog every single object, just look at this kitchen. It would take um, months, <laughs> hundreds, if not thousands of hours of labor. Uh, you're not seeing all of it. Mm -hmm. There are boxes of uh, little tiny accessories because the donor used to like to rotate the furnishings. So mm -hmm. in order to catalog every single one of these things, I mean, it's a whole other level of uh, mm -hmm. involvement. And then so there's also in that sense, this may never be cataloged completely. Mm -hmm. It'll be a work in progress for years. And there's minimum cataloging standards, right? Versus a, like a really robust, super detailed catalog might include every published reference to an object, like a full bibliographic profile and exhibition history and research notes and full provenance and full scanned records of conservation treatments and assessments. And, uh, of, you know, I mean, all of that for every single object to build out a full and complete catalog record is an extraordinary amount of time and energy and effort. So um, uh, oftentimes, right, you, you have a kind of a, a base or a minimum expectation for cataloging that includes location and descriptors and, and the kinds of information that you need. And then you have these uh, additions, you have the physical object file, you have your research files, um, but yeah. I think there, everything can always be more cataloged, right? <laughs> and, and many museums have a large backlog of, you know, when things came in 50 years ago, 75 years ago, 
and they weren't well cataloged or they were just put on the shelves and not cataloged at all. Um, one of the wonders of working in a museum is being able to spend time in the storeroom, looking at the objects and, and you know, just getting a sense of what's there and, and appreciating them in a way that you can't do by looking at pictures. But one thing that often happens in really large collections is you find things that have no number on them or um, numbers not in the catalog. So uh, it's an endless process of trying to not, one can never uh, obtain perfection, but um, finding things, making sure that, and retrospective, retroactive cataloging is, is an important part that often happens. My impression is that the Whaling Museum collections are in pretty good shape. The big, I think Naomi mentioned there's a few hundred thousand photographs. Mm -hmm. Those, those that's, that's a big job uh, to really make good catalogs of photographs is, is, a, is a project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like like Jordan said in the chat, the photography collection is the most under cataloged area of the collection. Um, and it's challenging to catalog that collection because it is comprised half of it approximately, probably a little more than half are actually negatives. Um, and so dealing with and identifying negatives and, and properly digitizing them is a really challenging and slow process, so. I'll say this in terms of, uh a backlog. There isn't a backlog of recent donations. We really keep up with what comes into the museum these days. Mm -hmm. A lot of the so-called backlog is legacy uh, from up to 100 years ago. Uh, as Steve said, uh, there were very lax standards. About <laughs> Often I find objects on the shelves that say L, which is a loan number. And I'm not sure that loan numbers in 1905 were necessarily <laughs> loans or <just laughs> implied donations because we have just so many of them. Right. Well, and we were talking about this, one of the museums I worked with previously had one person on staff whose job it was to go through genealogical records and identify the descendants of people who loaned things to the museum in the 1890s uh, to figure out if, if the descendants would actually just give it to the institution at that point. So I mean, I think uh, we, we are not alone in our company here. Um, I do see our time. We're five minutes past the hour here. Um, uh, are there more questions? We'll take a minute and let, let people uh, drop anything that's still lingering in the chat. But otherwise I'd say this has been a great pleasure to get to talk about um, the, the fun parts of the collection, the idiosyncrasies of it, the, uh, the unusual things that we get to deal with on a daily basis. Well, I don't see anything coming in. Oh, Sam is asking, how much of the collection is on display versus in storage? I'm not 100% certain, but my sense is that we're probably pre pretty close to peer institutions at about 10% on view. Um, one challenge there is that obviously the, the largest part of our collection, 750,000 objects are in our library and archive. and Obviously, um, very little of that is on view, although we do have um, log books and works on paper out in the galleries. Jordan, do you think that's a good estimation, Steve? Well, my guess is it's less just thinking of the photographs that you've got. That yes, most yeah. Not on display. And then it raises the question, what does it mean to be on view? If they're digitized and you can get them through the website, mm -hmm. they become available in, in significant ways. So mm -hmm. it becomes a, a tricky question. That's, the usual number that's talked about for art museums is one or two percent mm -hmm. of their collections are on on view. Uh, for science, uh, natural history collections, you know, it's it's a, uh, a tiny, tiny fraction because they're research collections. Mm -hmm. uh, so, museum collections have lots of purposes, not just viewing and exhibits, but research and. Um, you know, the in-depth sort of understanding that you can get from, from looking at objects. Um, and then the lucky 1% get to be out on display maybe. Yeah, and you raise a really good point. I think that's a nice kind of concluding note, which accessibility to collections has been totally revolutionized, you know, not just in the past 20 years, but in the last two years. 
uh, in terms of um, the ability for anyone to search most collections online. Uh, Pete is asking if our catalog is searchable and available to the public, and it is. So please visit our website uh, and you can search our collections uh, online. Uh, you can search the library collections and the photography and, and permanent collections there. And there are digitized items from our library, about 300 of them that are also available as fully scanned PDFs on Internet Archive, which is a great resource that we've started using through Digital Commonwealth. Um, there's a question from Jonathan. Do we uh, collect in cooperation or competition with other groups? We try to collect in cooperation. So our collections development plan is, it really tries to um, recognize what other institutions in the area are focusing on and not cross compete or collect against them. Uh, we want everybody to succeed uh, in their mission. Makes us stronger. I'll just add that that's a public document. It's on the museum's website. Um, it's important to let people know what you've got and, and uh, how you work with other institutions. Yeah. I'll also say we've even assisted some of these institutions with their own collections um, when something was deemed uh, outside of our scope, mm -hmm. uh, passing the materials along to their collections. Yeah. What Jordan's describing is a collections transfer, uh, and we, we have done that um, in some cases somewhat recently with regional institutions. Um, to share resources. <laughs> uh, Pete is asking, uh, how many copies of Moby Dick are in the collection? And I'm going to say that's a little bit hard to answer because we are also the official repository for the Melville Scholars Library. So I would say all of them. <laughs> Although they may not be accessioned into our collection, <laughs> uh, we are the home of all all things Moby Dick. <laughs> um, well, I feel like that, that feels like a good place to end. We're at 10 minutes after the hour here. I'm sorry, this PowerPoint just has a, it truly has a life of its own. Let's go back to the dollhouse. It's a very nice place to end. Um, well, this has been lovely. Jordan, Steve, uh, thanks pleasure. for joining me in this conversation. And uh, thank you to all of our attendees for coming and listening and uh, asking questions. I hope that you will come to the museum, see the Raleigh exhibition and um, tour our collections online too. So. Thank you all for attending. Thank you everyone. <laughs>